Welcome everyone. Um, um, I am happy to be here tonight on the first day of the European Mental Health Week. I'm very pleased to share today's experience with um, Patri Partinen from Finland, who is a colleague and a co-chair worker on the Mental Health Thematic Group of the European Region of World Physiotherapy. Today we have three people who will be um, uh, speaking to us about physiotherapy and mental health. As you all know, there is a very strong European movement um, which is promoting the mental well-being well of uh, European citizens and of global citizens. This need has been um, uh, vastly analyzed after um, the COVID pandemic. And between today and Friday, there is the celebration of the European Mental Health Week, um, which leaders are Mental Health Europe. So the European Mental Health Week um, uh, is in its fourth edition. We are very proud to announce that World, European Region of World Physiotherapy has always participated in this initiative. And in fact, following our participation, we have set up this new working group, which is the Mental Health Working Group, um, with regards to what is really needed at EU level and how physiotherapists can assist our clients, our patients in the mental health sector. Um, I am happy to start the introduction of my colleague, Tina Van Dam from Belgium, who is a member of the Mental Health Working Group of the European Region of World Physiotherapy. Tina is a physiotherapist specialized in mental health care and professor in the University of Kooloven in Belgium. This university has a specialized department of rehabilitation science and autism, and she's an expert in the center of Kooloven. So welcome to this webinar on physiotherapy in mental health care. And I would like to give a brief introduction to the world of physiotherapy in this specific setting. So I hope to take you along a short trip anyhow to uh, what the role is actually of physiotherapy in mental health care. Um, maybe before we start, it would be nice to know who we actually are. Uh, well, we are a thematic working group uh, on mental health situated within the European region of world physiotherapy. So we're all physiotherapists. And here you can see who actually chairs um, this working group as well as the members from the different countries. So my name is Tina van Damme and uh, I am from Belgium. So physiotherapy in mental health, you, you might wonder what on earth do physiotherapists have to do with mental health care? Um, and I, my point of today would be that actually physiotherapists are, in my opinion, in a unique position to actually at least form a little bit of a bridge between somatic and physical health and mental health care. Because as you know, in most countries anyhow, there is still quite a strict distinction between physical health care and mental health care system. So we have, for instance, general hospitals and psychiatric hospitals, but uh, this also means that, for instance, in psychiatric care or mental health care, we sometimes pay too little attention to the physical health of our patients, which is also the case in more general hospitals where we usually complain that there's not enough attention for mental health care. So um, as physiotherapists are actually trained in both fields, I believe that they have the opportunity or have the position of actually form a little bit a bridge between both worlds. Before starting off, it might be good also to know actually mental health, what are we talking about? What is the framework? So the WHO defines mental health as a state of well-being in which an individual realizes his or her own abilities, can cope with the normal stresses of life, can work productively and is able to make a contribution to his or her community. They also define health in general as a state of complete physical, mental and social well-being and not just merely the absence of disease. And I think this last one is a very important one. So they recognize that health includes physical, mental and social health. And not only it, it recognizes that it's just not just the absence of a disorder or a disease. To illustrate this, when we apply this to mental health, I think 
this model is an important one. So it's called the dual continuum model of mental health and mental illness. And basically what it says is that this is like a four arms. So you can either have a psychiatric condition or you don't. Uh, and you can either have a good mental well-being or poor mental well-being. It also implies that someone with a psychiatric condition may have actually have good mental well-being, while it can also be that you have poor mental well-being, although you do not have a psychiatric or psychological condition. And I think it's important to take along with us uh, when we go further into this presentation. The WHO also states that there is no health without mental health. What does it mean? It means that mental health is a part of health in general. And um, what is maybe even more important is that physical and mental health are actually connected to one another, they are intertwined. And as I commented upon earlier, we often split both uh, parts of health and we say this is physical and this is mental health and we actually disregard the idea that physical and mental health and it's not just an idea the evidence is there to support this uh, that they are actually connected to one another to give some examples to illustrate this starting from the mental health care perspective if you have a person someone with major depression then this person is very likely to have a very poor physical health we also know that because of the depression symptoms, this person is probably experiencing a lot of issues or problems to be physically active enough and probably will demonstrate more sedentary behavior, which in turn we know can influence again or can worsen the depression symptoms. So there is definitely a link between physical and mental issues here. If you take the other standpoint and start from more physical healthcare, there you have, for instance, an individual with COPD, which is a physical chronic lung disease. We know that these individuals have a much higher chance of developing a depression. And also we know that when they do, when they do have COPD and a depression or depressional symptoms, that it will negatively impact their rehabilitation process. So just to illustrate a little bit the back and forth of this. So what, what is the potential role of physiotherapists working in mental health care? Well, um, so we could wonder what, it, what is actually our place in mental health care? What is, for instance, the role of physical activity interventions? And what about the need? need for non-pharmacological interventions and I'm just picking and choosing a few things to think about and this picture may be a bit cynical but um, it holds true for most of the time by that I mean that when people have difficulties a disease disorder uh, we tend to go for uh, sometimes uh, quick solutions pharmacological solutions uh, surgery when needed and all of these treatments are of course absolutely necessary but sometimes you forget to think in the long run, what about lifestyle change? What about um, maybe including physical activity as part of it uh, into a, a lifelong skill that people can actually use? And that's actually where physiotherapists uh, come in or should come in. So to illustrate this a bit, and I do, I, I'm just focusing here on physical activity, there are other uh, points that can be of importance as physiotherapists. But to illustrate uh, what the role of physiotherapy potentially could be is, um, I'll use the example of physical activity. So physical activity interventions, we know, and this is very well supported by research, have a role to play in terms of prevention as well as the treatment of mental health uh, problems. If we take a look at prevention, there are three main points that are important. First of all, we know that if you have a higher level of physical activity, it is associated with better mental health. We also unfortunately know that we see lower levels of physical activity and lower levels of physical fitness across many different psychiatric populations. Mm -hmm. And what we also know is that there is a very high prevalence of some physical or somatic disorders in psychiatric populations. By far um, in the top 10 we see obesity, overweight, cardiometabolic risks, diabetes in much more much higher prevalence rates than we see in other uh, non-psychiatric populations. So we have a role to play in the prevention actually of physical health problems as well as mental health problems and physical activity might be a potential way to do so.
In terms of treatment, uh, physiotherapists use physical activity as a treatment where we directly treat actually or target symptoms of specific disorders. For instance, depression, we know that physical activity is effective uh, for depression symptoms, but also for ADHD, for anxiety and so on. And the second one, and I truly believe that this is even more maybe not even more important, at least as equally important, is that physical activity interventions have also the potential of improving the quality of life of individuals with even severe psychiatric conditions. And why do I emphasize this? It's because, of course, treatment should be directed towards targeting symptoms, but we also should focus on actually quality of life, especially in mental health disorders, where many of our patients or, um, need to live with these conditions for the rest of their life. So targeting quality of life uh, is also an important aspect that we should take into account. So let me go to a little bit an overview. What do the what do we do, physiotherapists in mental health care? So uh, basically, I think the, the interventions or the techniques we use can be divided a little bit into three approaches. One of them is the health-oriented approach, and I think I outlined it previously a little bit by focusing on the physical activity interventions. But we also use psychosocial-oriented approaches, and I'll, I'll point it out a little bit later in detail, and also more psychotherapeutic-oriented approaches. In some settings, one of these approaches might be a bit more at the forefront, while in others some, something else might be more of a focus. We also work with children up to the elderly, so all age ranges actually, and as being said before, we work in prevention as well as in care. In terms of the settings, we work in residential care, we work in community care, ambulatory care, so the different settings as well, and we work with individuals who have more mild Think about stress-related problems, for instance, to very severe uh, mental health problems such as psychosis or schizophrenia, uh, major depression and so on. So everything that is in between is also targeted. So from this you can see that actually we work in a lot of different settings with a lot of different populations and on top of that we use different techniques or approaches. So here they are, these approaches. Um, Health-oriented approach is an approach that is directed to improve actual physical health and functioning of people with mental health problems. So, as I outlined earlier, physical activity interventions fit perfectly within this category, actually. Uh, but we also use psychosocial approaches, which are, and this is a long sentence, directed actually to the acquisition of uh, both mental and physical proficiencies or skills that are related to the body motion and support actually personal development to enhance people's ability to function independently in society. So what does it mean? It means that we use interventions to think about uh, stress management, relaxation techniques. So we're trying to make our patients more skillful, social skills, stress management skills. It actually, it could be considered as a kind of transferable or lifelong skill uh, to enhance actually their possibilities to function in our societal context. And then finally, we have psychotherapeutic uh, approach, which is actually where we use the body or the motor domain as a gateway to improve social effective functioning of an individual. So think about mind-body interventions, trauma-related interventions, mindfulness interventions, and things like that. So to end this presentation, I would very, or would like to outline very briefly some of the basic principles to take with you. So first of all, it, um, the, the basis of what we do is holistic viewpoint. So we have a strong recognition that body and mind are connected. And moreover, we uh, start from the point that there is actually a continuous and also reciprocal, but also very complex interaction between different domains of functioning. So in general, we, we would divide them into body and motor domain, emotional, cognitive and social domain. And thus we recognize that we could also may improve cognitive functioning by using the body, or we could improve uh, social skills by using uh, 
physical exercise or physical activities or even physical games to actually improve social skills. So we do understand that there is uh, an interaction going on between these domains. And in children, you often talk about these domains as being developmental domains because they are still in, in development, of course. Apart from these strong interactions between mind and body, we recognize the presence of context. Uh, and by that, I mean that, well, if someone has, for instance, mental health problems, there might be some personal factors that might be important, such as temperament, cognitive ability, resilience, social skills of these individuals. But this individual will function within a certain societal context can be a very close context of the family context but also the broader context uh, is important so the society so things like environment socioeconomic status opportunities one might be given or not be given but also in the early childhood for instance parenting style so we also understand or take into account that context factors may impact this personal functioning and this connection between body and mind and therefore it might also be uh, true that we need to work with the context as well and then finally i would like to say that we use body movement any mind body technique as a gateway to improve uh, or to enhance skills and to actually uh, start the path of change. Um, to illustrate this, for instance, if you have a group of people uh, who are in the gym with you and you give them a physical exercise, let's say a very easy one, um, you say, okay, you need to build a bridge from one side of the room to the other and you may not touch the floor, but you all have to contribute, for instance. It means that this is a physical exercise that you can do, but for one person in the group, this might be about uh, communication and for some other person it might be about collaboration or some other person might be confronted with some body awareness techniques so by that I mean that we just use these exercises as a gateway to change which can be very individually different so the, the goals that we target um, in these uh, therapies can be very um, can be highly variable actually depending on the individual we have with us and this is actually a nice example of what we call the more psychotherapeutic approach where we use for instance in group settings physical exercises to actually enhance the, the social effective functioning of our patients so that was it actually very briefly but uh, i am confident that there will be some time for a q a afterwards um, so i hope uh, you enjoyed this presentation thank you very much and next we have christina pravo from spain she is the member of the mental health thematic group of Euro region of word physiotherapy and christina is a professor lecturer lecturer of university of Leda an expert on basic body awareness therapy. So go ahead, Christine. Good morning, good evening. I'm Christine Araujo from Barcelona, Spain, and it's, it's an honor to be here today and to have the opportunity to address you in this first webinar of Mental Health of Working Group of European Region of All World Physiotherapy. I would like to talk about the scientific evidence in physiotherapy and mental health. Why well, discuss uh, research in physiotherapy and mental health? Well, the first one is physiotherapy and mental health is an emerging field within the profession that address the current uh, healthcare needs of society, especially in the consequence of the recent pandemic. And also it is an specialized area of physiotherapy that relies on scientific evidence that I derive it from clinical practice. Nowadays, uh, all interventions are completely re re reviewed and evaluated based on scientific criteria. Although, as we shall see later, we still have a lot of work to do. Uh, the role of mental health physiotherapy is part of a multidisciplinary team, which includes uh, professionals such as psychologists, psychiatrists, nurses, occupational therapists, and the others. The characteristics of psychiatry pathologies make it necessary for the sum of different professionals to be able to deal 
with the patients in an effective way. It is very essential to promote this role within the multidisciplinary mental health team. For the development of profession, it is crucial to define the responsibilities and competence of physiotherapists in this specialization carefully. For its development, we need a specialized training, scientific research and advocacy through the policymakers for the establishment of that profile in public health care. How much scientific literature exists currently? <clears throat> on May 18, I conducted a search on PubMed combining uh, physical therapy and physiotherapy with mental health. I found uh, 21,594 articles published to date using physical therapy and 6,446 uh, um, articles using physiotherapy. If we limit the search to the last 10 years, uh, we find 5,305 um, articles. Out of these, 1,044 are randomized control trials and 754 are systematic reviews or meta-analysis. This indicates the great interest in mental health physiotherapy among scientific uh, researchers, and also the development of the profession in scientific research. As you can see in the graph, the number of publications has significantly increased since uh, 29 until the present date. Uh, according to the bibliometric study conducted by physiotherapist Lidia Carvalho from Spain, which analyzes uh, the published scientific evidence on physiotherapy and exercise in mental health, the countries with the highest number of publications are the United States, United Kingdom, Australia, Canada, Chinese, Germany, Spain, Brazil, Italy, and the Netherlands. Uh, as you can see, uh, the United States is the leading country with almost the double of number of publication compared to the United, United Kingdom. In the next slide, we found um, Lydia with uh, phone uh, 19, uh, 1988 articles and classified the most published topics from the select papers. The main topic published in this field include physical activity and eating disorders and addictions. Uh, this is attributed to the strong evidence supporting the efficacy, the efficacy of physical activity in the treatment of this disorder, while the evidence for other therapies is more limited. limited. Additionally, topics of mental health um, in aging, chronic disease and cancer, exercise and in neurological issues, chronic pain and severe mental disorders emerge too. And you can see the map of the, these, these topics in, in this uh, graph. Uh, in this presentation, I have classified some of the main tools in physiotherapy for mental health, such as physical activity and therapeutic exercise, as well as movement and body awareness therapies. Additionally, I wanted to refer reference qualitative research on the quality of movement, which provides a comprehensive framework that defines the context of movement awareness therapy, whether or not it belongs to physiotherapy. Examples of these therapies as basic body awareness therapy, yoga, tai chi, qigong, or some muscle change approaches. Uh, there are many, there are many uh, studies evaluating the effectiveness of exercise in mental health disorders, but I would like to highlight this particular one 
one, as it uh, analyzes the mechanism through which exercise proves beneficial. In this article of Smith and Mervyn of 2022, 21, sorry, the authors emphasize three mechanisms. The first one is the donic effect of exercise, which in induce a general physical well-being. The second, uh, they also discuss uh, improvements in neurobiological pathways and neuroplasticity. And finally, they highlight the behavioral role of exercise, such as the sense of self-efficacy and self-regulation. In this study of 2019, we are informed that although there is evidence regarding the effectiveness, uh, there is a lack of data on the cause of savings the physical activity interventions provide the healthcare systems. This should to encourage us to reconsider the research conducted by physiotherapists in this field. Um, this is a key point to take on with that in the field of the research in physiotherapy and mental health, by my opinion. <laughs> In the next, uh, the following slide, we can observe a meta-analysis uh, conducted in 2016 on the effectiveness of exercise treating depressive symptoms. Uh, the analysis indicates that the exercise is more effective than the control treatment, also the not no treatment or usual treatment is a control that they use. Although a no significant difference were compared, were found compared to psychological treatment or antidepressant medication. A moderate effect in favor or in favor of aerobic resistance or mixed moderate um, uh, mixed exercise with moderate to high intensity was observed compared to usual treatment. However, the question of whether supervised exercise or unsupervised exercise will, will alter the result is raised. We also find similar results when examine, examining the effects in the adolescent population. However, we again observe moderate heterogeneity among the conducted studies. But the results is very similar in adults and on, in adolescents. It's effective. Um, regarding anxiety symptoms, exercise also demonstrates favorable, favorable results compared to usual treatment. However, in uh, this is the results of in favor of exercise, as you can see. Um, and this is the highlights that the author, authors uh, publish. But in, in another more recent uh, um, article and meta-analysis, um, uh, it shows that effect size is smaller than the, that there is still significant heterogeneity to draw meaningful conclusions. In that case, we also observe moderate levels of heterogeneity. Uh, in other time, we uh, have the question about the quality of our uh, research in mental health, but uh, all indicates that uh, our effectiveness in this uh, condition too. In now, I present to you some evidence regarding the effectiveness of exercise in major mental disorders. In schizophrenia, the recent study by Shidama in 2022 demonstrates a significant improvement in cognitive functioning compared to usual treatment. It also defines aerobic exercise as the most recommended options when supervised by a professional. That the most effective dosage in, is more than 90 minutes per week for a duration of three months. 
and also there are uh, good evidence. The next uh, is regarding eating disorders. Physiotherapy mental health plays a significant role in, this, in the functional rehabilitation of these patients. Although physical exercise, exercise is not a first uh, choice intervention, other physiotherapeutic techniques have been described as effective. This includes stretching, isometric exercise, cardiovascular activities in some levels of the disease, only in, it's not in, in a high level of disease, massage, uh, basic body awareness therapy, and high intensity resistance programs. In this disease, movement awareness therapies such as yoga uh, are also effective as demonstrates by this study showing moderate effectiveness in relation to bulimia and binge eating disorders. I would like to highlight a physiotherapy intervention that belongs to the field of movement awareness therapy, such as VIVAT, basic body awareness therapy. In recent years, numerous randomized clinical trials have been published on basic body awareness therapy in various health conditions, including depression, scoliosis, osteoarthritis, fibromyalgia, chronic white plus, emotional trauma, and eating disorders. This demonstrates that basic body awareness therapy is an effective tool within the physiotherapy in mental health with great uh, potential for further development. VIVAT is a uh, body awareness training program aimed at enhancing the quality of movement to improve both the physical and mental well-being of individuals. It is based on promoting, promoting balance, breathing, and self-awareness. And finally, I would like to highlight the qualitative research conducted by Dr. Elif Scherven of Movement Quality and in each promotion. Uh, she has a doctoral thesis on definition and dissemination, dissemination of the concepts of movement quality and the preconditions for the physiotherapist body awareness training. This concept is fundamental and shared across all movement awareness therapies, providing significant value and advancing the professional. The first article discussed the necessary factors for promoting movement quality and the learning cycle. The second one uh, article focused on describing the phenomenon and dimension of movement quality. In the consensus paper, all components of VIVAL are described by different experts in the field. And lastly, uh, there is a discussion on how to effectively communicate the concept of movement quality. Here are the references for all the articles used in the presentation. And in conclusion, physiotherapy mental health has a great deal of proven evidence, but the methodological quality of the studies need to be uh, In addition, clinical, clinical trials should include variables to evaluate the economic savings of this type of intervention in public health system. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Christina. Um, I would like to extend my thank you to Christina who has been representing um, the thematic group of the European Region of World Physiotherapy on the thematic network of the EU Commission. Christina has managed to do a lot together with the group, but obviously she is our face at EU level with the EU Commission. We just presented a poster. Um, if you, because in the chat, I'm seeing that all of you want to get further info. Um, our general secretary, Mr. Aitor, will be posting the link to the page of our thematic group, which is still very raw, but in the process of it's building up its information. So keep following this page because obviously the more resources we develop together, the more we'll be able to share. Um, uh, now we go on to our next speaker, who is a dear colleague, Tanya Bolk from Finland. Tanya as well is a member on the working group of Europe region of World Physiotherapy. Um, and Tanya specializes in psychophysical physiotherapy and has worked especially psychiatric physiotherapy care over the last 10 years. 
Tania was previously the president of the Finnish Association of Psychophysical Physiotherapy and is currently the vice president of the Finnish Association of Physiotherapists. Tania, the floor is yours and we are ready to go. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. My name is Tanja Balk, and I'm going to talk to you shortly about clinical practice in mental health. Uh, so I come from Finland and I work in specialist psychiatric care and I work in Helsinki University Hospital in Department of Psychiatry and Division of Mood Disorders. And there I work with outpatient clinics in Tikkurila and Myrmäki. Earlier, I have also worked in inpatient wards and in forensic psychiatry in Vanta prison. So working in, uh, working in psychiatry is uh, teamwork and physiotherapists work as part of a multi-professional team in, uh, with psychiatrists, psychologists, psychotherapists, have psychiatric nurses, social workers, occupational therapists and experts by experience. And these experts by experience are actually our former patients. So here you can see some of my patient groups. This is not uh, all the diagnoses my patient may have, but some and uh, maybe the most common ones. Um, I work mostly with patients that have a diagnosis of post-traumatic stress disorder. Uh, also many have different kinds of anxiety disorders, depression or bipolar disorder. Many have different kinds of eating disorder or body dysmorphic disorder. Uh, many uh, mental health patients have different kind of chronic pain or sleep disorders, uh, somatoformic disorders. And these days, uh, there are increasing amount of young adults who are going through some kind of re reflection on gender identity and uh, also gender dysphoria. So why we need physiotherapy? Uh, Christine and Tine already explained this uh, quite nicely, but I want to add uh, some point also. But we, we can start uh, from Finland. In Finland, during the year, every fifth suffers from some kind of mental, mental health challenges. So it's quite a lot. And the most common are depression, anxiety, and substance abuse disorders. And you all know that depression and anxiety are really common all around Europe and actually all, all around the world. So we need to have all the professionals working with these issues. We can't just give them pills or use uh, psychotherapy because we know these days that how we feel different kinds of emotion is not such, just something that happens in our head. It's something that we feel in our whole body. And I wanted to show you this uh, picture. It's a bodily maps of emotions and it's from a study uh, that have uh, been done in Finland. And this study uh, have, um, been done in, in Europe and in Asia. And they ask people that how they feel different uh, emotions in their body, or do they feel their, uh, feel these emotions in their body at all. So you can see different kind of emotions there. And uh, if you see more uh, reds and uh, yellows, then you feel more emotions in that body part. And if you see more uh, blues or light blues, then you feel less yeah, emotions and feelings in that part, uh, body part. And if you see black, it's a neutral feeling. So we feel different kind of emotions in our body. Uh, and the somatosensory feedback has been proposed to trigger conscious emotional experiences. So if you think of yourself, how do you feel in your body when you feel happy or angry or sad, or if you are anxious? So there are really different kind of feelings also in, in, in your body when you feel these kind of emotions. So if you feel happy, how is your posture? How is your body, bodily tension? Or how do you use your voice? How do you move? And if you're angry, how is your posture then? How is your body tension then? How do you use your voice? How do you move? Or if you're really feeling sad, how is this different? Or if you feel really anxious? So how is that different? And if you look at this picture of depression, you actually feel really numb. So you don't actually feel your body that much at all. So everything we feel in, in the body, how we move, how we are, and how we use our body affects to our mind, our thinking, and to our mood. And at the same time, everything we think and we, and we feel and what our mood is affects to our bodily uh, experience and to our movement. So we need to consider the body as well. We just uh, can't just think about the uh, mind or thinking when we are working with 
uh, mental health issues. So what we do when we see the patient for the first time, for, for, as, as a physiotherapist, of course, we do assessment and examination. So uh, the patient's ability to move and function is evaluated quite holistically, uh, considering the patient's resources, motivation and cooperation and interaction skills. And different areas to be evaluated together with the patients are their body image or body awareness, their posture and movement, their ability to relax, their breathing and body reactions, their physical performance, their content of life, and also daily routines. And the tools and methods that we are using are, of course, interviewing, observation, patient self-assessment, different kinds of symptom questionnaires. We can use manual examination. We can ask the patient to do some kind of uh, pain map or drawing and ask the, ask the patient to feel exercise or sleep diary. We can check the muscle con the condition and do mobility and balance test. We can do uh, use different kinds of assessment methods of body awareness and also use video recordings. And based on uh, all of the assessment, the goals and methods are planned together with the patient. So the patient is always in the center. And then we decide whether physiotherapy is uh, concerned, uh, carried out uh, in, individually or in groups. And individually, we try to support the patient's active role in rehabilitation. So it's not something that physio does to the patient, it's something that the patient learns to do differently. And we try to teach ways to manage their symptoms, in example, anxiety or pain or depression and stuff like that. And we, of course, try to support the physical activity. As uh, Christina explained, it's really important to include physical activity uh, when we're dealing with mental health issues. Of course, we also try to su uh, support the development of more positive body image and strengthening their body awareness and also supporting their interaction skills. And in groups, the groups are more determined more precisely according to the needs of the group. Groups can be open or closed. Uh, open groups are more like the gym or stuff like that. And the closed groups are more process groups focused on a certain team or symptom. In example, sleep group, body image group, relaxation course, anxiety management, pain management, etc. And in, in, that, in addition, the physiotherapists uh, work also part of multi-professional groups, in example, groups for bipolar disorder or uh, post-traumatic stress disorder. And what the physiotherapy uh, content is, it's uh, uh, mainly therapeutic exercises, different kind of body awareness exercises, uh, uh, multiple different uh, movement exercises, breathing and relaxation exercises, as well as exercises that strengthen interaction. We use quite a lot of psychoeducation and help promoting counseling and also can use manual therapy. So a few examples of what we actually do. So uh, I have two examples and uh, first a depression. Now I want you to imagine how it actually would feel if you are depressed. So this is just one, one example. This is not the one truth, but this is a, one idea how it might feel. So try to imagine that you are depressed. Uh, you have low mood, uh, you have reduction of energy, decrease in activity, you have reduced capacity for enjoyment, mm. interest and concentration. You can feel really tired after even minimum effort. You might have really disturbed sleep or insomnia. Your body might feel really heavy or really sluggish. Um, you might uh, have difficulty starting every activity and you might have desire to withdraw. So depression is not just something that happens in your mind. It, it, it's, some, it's something that affects to your whole self and to your whole life and uh, your uh, interaction with everyone. Mm -hmm. So then what we can do as a physios? Well, first of all, of course, like uh, Tina and Christina al already explained, uh, we need to plan and guide the increase of physical activity. This is really important part of working with uh, depression. And sometimes, uh, well, mostly we need to increase the physical activity. In sometimes, with some patients, we need to actually decrease the physical activity, but uh, mostly uh, increase the physical activity. Then most of the uh, pe people who have depression sleep quite poorly. So we need to give them sleep, uh, teach them sleep hygiene, and also uh, teach them ways uh, for better sleep. 
Uh, also, many people with depression have different kind of pain issues. Uh, they might have low back pain or neck pain or headaches or um, also pain just because they don't move that much. So we need to give them pain management skills. And also uh, many have uh, anxiety, so we need to also teach them anxiety management. And even though you might think that, okay, depressed people, they, they don't do things, they just, uh, just lie down the whole day, but still they might be really uh, stressed, they might feel really tensed, they don't sleep, they don't eat, they don't move. So they need to also learn relaxation skills, so how they can uh, affect uh, to the stress or anxiety or get the body moving. And when you're depressed, it eats all the colors from your life and you have uh, lost the meaning in your life. So we need to find, again, the ways to have meaningful content of life and also daily routines. And working with de de depression, you also need to give hope and give that, uh, keep that hope up uh, and, and give that hope that someday that person is going to see the colors again. And then the next example is about anxiety. And uh, I know that uh, every one of us have felt anxiety sometimes. Uh, but when we talk about anxiety disorders, you need to multiply that normal anxiety like a hundred times. So it's really strong physical feeling. So it's not just something in your in, uh, some idea or thought. It's really strong physical uh, feeling. So if you try to again. Uh, imagine how it might feel that you have anxiety. So you might have uh, palpitation, so your heart is breathing really fast. You might have really heavy chest pain. You might have choking sensation, like you're actually choking. Uh, you might feel really dizzy. Your body might be trembling. Your muscle might be really tensed or you're sweating all the time. You feel lightheaded or uh, you have epigastric discomfort and you don't sleep. You might have disturbed sleep or insomnia. And because these feelings are really strong, uh, you might be really afraid of your body and your body's symptoms. And you might even be afraid that you're having a heart attack or stroke because these feelings are so strong. So of course, you don't want to feel these feelings. So you start to narrowing your everyday life. You start to avoid uh, stress, stressful situations because you don't, don't want to feel this anxiety and these bodily symptoms. So you, one day you might find that you're just staying home, you don't do anything anymore, you don't go to work, you don't go to school, you don't see your friends, you don't go to grocery store or anywhere. You're sitting at home because you're afraid of your, these symptoms, but still you feel anxiety. So what can we can do as physios? For first of all, we are the experts of the body. So we need to explain the anatomy and physiology of why the body react, reacts this way and these ways to influence the body's sensations. So the patients doesn't need to be afraid of their own body and the body's sensations and symptoms anymore. So it's a safe place to be. It's okay to feel anxious, your um, anxiety, uh, you're not having a stroke, you're not having a heart attack, this anxiety, and you can do things to help yourself. Then we can plan and guide the increase of physical activity. Activities are sometimes we also need to decrease the physical activity, but mainly increase the physical activity. And because many people with anxiety sleep quite poorly, we need to again teach sleep hygiene and try to find ways to sleep better. And people with uh, anxiety have many kinds of pain problems. Also, they mostly have pain in their shoulders and their necks, headaches, migraine, or stomach ache, because they're so tensed all the time and they're, they're feeling really stressed. So we need to also teach them relaxation skills and pain management skills. And of course, we also have to find some meaningful content of life so that they can get their life back that they have the courage to do the things that they actually want to do. They don't have to be afraid of the symptoms and they can still do uh, their uh, normal everyday uh, stuff. So patients with uh, anxiety need the sense of control and feeling of safety, that even though my heart is breathing, it's really hard to, uh, my heart is beating and it's really hard to breathe, I can still do things and I have uh, means to, 
control my body. Uh, by control, I don't mean that we need to be in control uh, all, all the time. That I that by control, I mean that they have means um, to influence the body sensation. That they can influence the way of breathing. They can influence the body tension. And by by these uh, means, they can also affect the uh, heart beat, uh, beating and stuff like that. So they they feel that okay. I can do things to help myself. This is uh, uh, safe. So we have a really important role uh, working with people with different kind of mental health issues. This is just depression and anxiety, but these are the most common. So that's why I wanted to uh, teach a little, uh, uh, speak a little bit about those. So keep it short. Thank you. Thank you, Tanya. Very interesting presentation. Um, interesting as well how you correlated the element of pain and the, the, the actual symptoms that one would feel due to a mental health, you know, um, uh, issue rather than a physical issue. Um, uh, we have also today launched a joint statement with the societal impact of pain, which speaks about the, the, the biopsychosocial implications of having chronic pain, which latches on a lot to what Tanya explained um, just now. So, thanking Tina, Christina, and Tanya, it's finally time for discussion. So, I would like to start off by inviting a dear colleague from Greece, Tavros. He has told me on the chat that he has been a physiotherapy working in mental health since 1988. Stavros, I leave the floor to you. Feel free to introduce yourself, perhaps tell us a bit as well about your experience, over 20 years of experience in mental health. And uh, feel free to ask the questions that you have already indicated in the chat. The floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you. At first, hello to everybody. Uh, it's a great pleasure for me to be and uh, uh, to watch all of that. Uh, as uh, you told, I'm uh, occupied in physiotherapy and mental health since 1988. And uh, now it's important to have all of this webinar of the European Physiotherapy Association and especially the working group. That means that we make steps day by day. Second, uh, my best uh, congratulations to all the speakers were real focus on the, what is physiotherapy and mental health. And uh, I think that the audience uh, can achieve a lot of uh, about and takes the stimulus of uh, physiotherapy and mental health. And uh, in our, as I am uh, the president of the physiotherapist and mental health in Greece, uh, we have uh, the, the ninth international congress in uh, Greece on the physiotherapy and mental health. It was, what's the next day? So the next day is the European uh, region physiotherapy. That is great. And uh, that I would like to propose uh, to this working group is to have a common language for the European uh, countries. At first, we need the data because if we have data and we have data on the electronic prescribing of psychiatric illness, uh, according to the ICD-10, because we are in Europe and we use ICD-10, uh, that means that we can have, at first, how many real people is uh, on the mental health and will be our uh, future patients. And uh, second, when we have data in all of the European and also by state, we can make it better and focus clinical. Uh, second, about uh, the, the uh, prescribing to exercise, we have, uh, my proposal is to use the exercises medicine protocol that is fit, the frequency intensity type and type. So we have a common language to have good protocols and and I think also to be in a situation recognition that when we use in all the European Union the same protocols and the same also prescribing paper. It's important to have in our language the same prescribing paper. That means that is a good institutional recognition because scientifically uh, we are just in a very good way uh, since 90, uh, 2011 that we are recognized by the World Physiotherapy Association. So my greetings for the future of this working group. I'm disposed to 
help all uh, of you uh, whenever you think you like, I'm at your disposal. Thank you. Thank you, Stavros. Um, uh, as a gentle reminder, I would like to remind you that a call for the European Region Mental Health Group comes out currently. So if you are members of your professional body in your country, you can, and in Europe, you can eventually even contribute to this activity. Um, Christina, Tani, I don't know if you want to comment on what, or reply to Mr. Stav Stavros' comments. Christina, you want to go first? Okay, uh, I am agree with uh, that comments because uh, it's very, very important to be uh, in union in this in this team uh, and to explain the same language. This is the reason that I uh, present the, the work of, of Leif Scherben because in, in other um, field in body awareness therapies and movement quality, she uh, collect all the content of the experts and putting in the context of all expertise. And I think in the exercise, uh, we have to, to go with a great unit because um, it's our field, I think, and we we can treat the patients and not only do prevention or promotion, uh, but uh, we ha we can uh, do a great treatment, and uh, I think it's, it's a good idea. I agree with you. Thank you. Thank you, Christina. Tani, would you like to comment? Mm. I don't. I don't know. Do I have to, anything to <laughs> add? To that? Just give Maybe me not the floor. at this point. Yes. Okay. So um, uh, I am happy to pass um, uh, the floor to a colleague from Spain, Paula. Paula, you can present our, your question, and perhaps if you want to address a specific speaker, feel free to do so. Thank you very much, Paula. And in the meantime, I would like to welcome Esther Mary, the chair of the Europe Region of World Physiotherapy. Hello, Esther Mary. Welcome. Well, um, hi, my name is Paula. Um, first of all, uh, congratulations for all your presentations. And my question is, what is the actual need or why is necessary a uh, physiotherapist on the field of mental health. I mean, I understand when there are uh, big issues or when you have somatic changes, the figure of a uh, physiotherapist uh, becomes more natural. But what about when you have a patient with, a, a, with a, for example, um, depression or just anxiety without any somatic changes, uh, if, if that is actually possible. <laughs> so why? Why us and not just uh, any trainer or any um, yoga trainer, for example? Okay, very interesting question. Um, Christina, Tanya, would you like to reply to this question? Sure, I can sure. start. Uh, yes, I can start. Uh, well, first of all, because the physios have all the knowledge about different diseases and illnesses and uh, anatomy and physiology, so that's the main point. The yoga teacher or the PTs uh, might not have any of that. And so if we actually uh, trying to uh, work with patients with severe mental health issues, we need to uh, also have this kind of profession and uh, and I'm not sure uh, did I understand correctly that uh, that you meant that uh, if people have a uh, depression or anxiety and then something uh, somatic disease or or somatic changes uh, if we think anxiety you don't have to have any other diseases or or even pain or any anything like that it's actually really physical symptom anxiety it's really physical 
feeling. And if you do the di diagnosis for anxiety, it's a list of physical symptoms. It's not something just in your head. It's a list of physical symptoms and also, of course, uh, frightful thoughts and stuff like that. But it's a list of physical symptoms. And if there's just a doctor or psychotherapist thought, talking to that patient. It's such words. It's the head talking. Talking. No one thinks about the uh, body and the body's feelings and say, 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 sensations and, and how they might be afraid of their own body. So that's why we need physio. This is the one point. And uh, the other point is that actually we feel all the emotions in our body. So if we just think that feelings are something in our head, we miss quite a lot when we're working with uh, mental health patients. Of course, physios don't have to work alone with these patients. They, actually, they also needs, might need those, dr those drugs and they might need the uh, doctors and uh, nurses, but they actually need uh, the physios also because none of those uh, are doing anything uh, active with them. They're only talking or giving drugs. So then we just lose the whole person. We only use words and drugs. We need to treat the whole person to have some change. Of course, some with uh, quite moderate uh, mental health issues, if you have to quite moderate uh, depression, it usually goes away by itself. You don't need to do anything. But if you have more severe uh, depression, you need help. So physios is one part of the, in that puzzle. It's not the only part in that puzzle, but we have a, quite a lot to do with these patients. Thank you. Thank you, Tanya. Um, as you can see, there is a lot of work to do in even, you know, um, uh, capturing the scope of physiotherapists and mental health. And this is how this group was brought about at EU level. So uh, um, feel free to connect with us, to connect with the Europe region of World Physiotherapy, because we all know that this group is going to become bigger, it's going to become a movement. We are very, very lucky to have um, a political influence at EU level. The commission is on board at EU level, with also the member states that are trying to do a lot at national level. And let's be frank, the pandemic did work, you know, um, in favor of this direction. Um, so, so let's engage, let's discuss further. And we obviously are here um, to help you at national level to, um, to be able to collect further information and rest assured that all your recommendations are being written throughout today's discussion. Now I have to read a question from a colleague, um, Georgios from Greece, who um, uh, has posted a very interesting question to you, Tanya, <laughs> again, um, with regards to um, a very important element that you touched upon in your presentation on sleep hygiene and how to manage anxiety. And the question says so, how can we teach the sleep hygiene and how can we achieve the anxiety management to our patients as physiotherapists? Question addressed to Miss Tanya Blake Bolk, but um, Christina, if you would like to contribute, feel free to do so as well. Thank you, Christina. Tanya, kind of go first. Okay. Uh, I'm not sure where to start. Maybe with the sleep hygiene. Uh, I think that uh, sleep hygiene is something quite basic information that all physios should know, and we should talk about that uh, to our patients and ask how they're sleeping. Because if they sleep, if, even though they don't have any uh, mental health issues, uh, even if they have pain, they're mostly sleeping quite poorly. But with mental health issues, they are sleeping usually quite poorly. And that uh, affects also that if you uh, don't sleep, you have more anxiety. If you don't sleep, your mood is lower. So you need the sleep to uh, have good health. So we need to teach them the, teach them the basics of uh, sleep hygiene. I think this is the basics that every physician should, should know and have in, in their uh, uh, this, uh, in, uh, education. But of course, we uh, go through that, uh, that you need to go to bed every day at the same time and you need to eat, uh, eat in the evening and you need, need to put the lights down and you need to actually have activities in the day if you just lie down the whole whole day 
then you don't sleep at night because you don't you haven't got any uh, physical activity. Your body uh, uh, hasn't done anything, so it it wouldn't it won't sleep. And if you just worry uh, all the evenings, then you <laughs> don't sleep uh, as well. And and if you feel really tense or have anxiety, then you can't sleep because your body has this alert mode. You can't sleep if you're feeling uh, uh, quite st stressful or have anxiety. So we need to work with these issues also. So we quite uh, we need to think the sleeping quite holistic, holistic, <laughs> holistically. So it's not just one thing, and it's different things with different pa patients. So I. Uh, uh, I think we don't have time to uh, have a lecture about all the uh, issues in sleep hygiene. And then uh, was there another question about anxiety management? Maria, was it about anxiety management? Yes, it was the second part of the question. Yes. Well, it's, uh, it's again, uh, 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 if we think the anxiety, different people have anxiety because of different reasons. So we need to find the reasons why this be people, uh, person is, uh, have this anxiety and what influences to that, what uh, makes it uh, higher and what helps uh, to re reduce it and why find different kind of ways. Many people need to have the sense of control because the bodily sensations are so strong. So they need to have a feeling that they can do something to, the, to those feelings. We can do different kind of breathing exercises. We can do different kind of movement exercises. We can uh, go to gym to do deadlifts or go to running the stairs or, or we can uh, teach them different kind of things to use the uh, body tension uh, in their favor because their body is really tensed but it's not something that they have decided to have so we can use the body ten uh, bodily tension uh, so that their, their mind uh, is influenced also that they can decide how they're tensing their body how they're using their body so they can get the feeling of control that even though their heart is feeding or 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 it's really hard to breathe, or they feel that they're uh, joking, they can still do, uh, do quite many things to help these feelings, and they can reduce the anxiety. And, and then it might even be that because they have these uh, means to influence in these sensations, they don't have that much anxiety anymore, because that also causes anxiety that the fear of having anxiety. So when you don't have to fear anymore that you have anxiety because you know that you have things that you can do to help yourself, you have less anxiety. Thank you, Tanya. It's a very interesting perspective. The vicious cycle of getting better or getting worse is always simplified by the current situation. Um, and we obviously, as professionals, we have to be very aware of consequences and, as you rightly said, the verb is but also, most importantly, the non-verbals. Christina, would you like to add something to the sleep yes. hygiene and the anxiety management? The floor is yours, Christina. Yes, uh, I I will explain that one role of or one part of our role as physiotherapy is education uh, to patients and is uh, or or knowledge about the mental health disease uh, we can help uh, to the patients only with the education and is enough. Uh, forever. Um, What's more, if we can involve the body and do exercise and, and do body awareness is, is better, but um, only understand, the, the patient could understand that he or she feels and why the body reactions are, is, is a great advance in their manage and uh, the aim of our, um, a role is uh, to, to give uh, skills uh, and tools to the patients to manage the, their uh, situation and uh, self-care and take self-care about uh, their disease all this. <laughs> Thank you, Christina. Um, now I would like a colleague from Turkey to ask a question. Phyllis, the floor is yours. Feel free to address 
whoever you would like to fill this. Thank you. Thank you very much. Although uh, it's a great now, uh, all the presentation are very good. Congratulations. Uh, actually, I would like to ask some question to all speakers. Maybe they give their comments. First of all, I would like to ask whether they have also some patients who are older patients uh, 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 with dementia or Alzheimer. And then do you have any uh, consideration for the older people who is suffering from dementia or mental problems? Or do you have uh, uh, special interventions for it? And the second one, uh, second question of mine, uh, do you, you do you use manual therapy, especially at the beginning of the sessions for the patients who is suffering from schizophrenia? Uh, because some of them are not uh, are uh, having such a uh, you know cautious to be touched in your in their body. So uh, I would like to ask whether do you have these kind of uh, difficulties? And the second one, uh, third one, sorry, I have many questions. Uh, do you also use music therapy or other kinds of therapy like Wonder Garden therapy? And then what is your comment? Because in the literature, there is not evidence-based uh, results for it, but maybe you have some clinical experience. Uh, that's why I'm wondering that you have this kind of experience in your clinics. Thank you, Phyllis. Um, Christina, would you like to go first? Okay. Okay. I I, I think I remember all the other questions. Um, she explained about the schizophrenia treatment. Do you yeah, al Alzheimer and dementia patients? Al yes, Alzheimer. Exist. I'm not expert about Alzheimer, but I know I show you the. Um, research about elderly uh, situations or conditions mm -hmm. existing in mental health physiotherapy mm -hmm. and is regarding um, um, exercise, uh, bodily functions, mm -hmm. uh, balance, mm -hmm. etc. And but I'm not expert about that. I know I don't know if Tanka can help more in this question. And um, the other question was about uh, manual therapy. Do you have any difficulties? Manual therapy. therapy. Manual therapy. Yeah. Manual therapy. I, I'm not sure that uh, it's not the main uh, therapy in mental health. It's not the most uh, usually therapy because uh, the most usually therapies in mental health are active uh, therapies because uh, we need to involve the patient in their rehabilitation and it's essential uh, that the patient are inside of the treatment and you can guide the treatment, but uh, all the um, uh, therapy or the movements are uh, active in, in these uh, pathologies, yeah. And then what about the music therapy and other kinds of alternative uh, type therapies? What? Or, uh, what about the music therapy? Ah, uh, music. And other, uh, and yes. other complementary therapies? Mm, I don't know um, so much about music. Uh, in body awareness, they, they are... Um, uh, don't uh, use any music, any music, because we uh, need to be aware of our body. And music yeah. sometimes yeah. Uh, can distract, mm -hmm. uh, and the rhythm or the uh, the music can like you or, or not, and it's not uh, the best um, way to do uh, in body awareness therapies. Okay. In exercise is different, but it. it if you need a concentration in your body, the music is a disturb. It's not usually. Hmm. Yeah, I know. I know the body awareness therapy do not include music therapy at the same time. No. You have to be all by yourself and you have to feel your inner sense and then uh, to think about 
body and mind uh, connection. But at the other hand, as a different uh, 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 complementary therapy, do you use oh. music therapy, just a separate therapy? No, I don't, don't I don't know about okay, that. Thank you. Okay. Sorry. And I can continue. Or yes, Tanya, go ahead, please. In, in Finland, we use music therapy, uh, at least in with children and adolescents. So we have, we have music therapists uh, doing the separate therapy, <laughs> using different kind of music therapy. And there was just uh, neurosonic music therapy techniques. Uh, some Someone uh, mentioned in the uh, chat box. Yes. So they use different kind of ways uh, working with music. Uh, I have uh, worked with elderly in psychiatric uh, settings. Um, and we have physios working in in uh, uh, psychiatric, psychiatric care for elderly, and uh, they need all the same stuff that uh, adults need also. But um, um, so they have different kind of exercises, uh, exercising groups. They have more like groups for going to gym or uh, balance. Uh, doing balancing uh, balance exercise we have groups for anxiety management groups for better sleep group groups for pain management of course they have uh, treat them also individually so it's uh, mostly the all the same uh, things but working with um, with these um, uh, memory uh, i lost the word illness with memory what was it? I lost the word. It's okay, Tanya. <laughs> if it comes, just let us know. Yeah, yeah <laughs> well, Maria, you know, it's illness with memory. You don't remember things. What was the name? Cognitive uh, f uh, illness for memory? Dementia. Yeah. Dementia, dementia, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe I have dementia. Uh, <laughs> so. Okay. So th then you need the body more because when you don't have words maybe anymore the, or your cognitive, cognitive function is uh, uh, is in there that it's you're not that highly functioning anymore with your cognitive uh, uh, skills then you need more the tactile skills that you need to more have that someone someone is touching and guiding and you do together and you move so it actually helps with your dementia also so they we have physios working with that field also mm -hmm. but uh i was there years ago so I, i'm not expert in that anymore and working with uh, schizophrenia and these uh, uh, manual techniques uh it's the same and as Christina said, the manual techniques isn't the first first step we are doing. It might be part of what we are doing, uh, but even working with uh, PTS, uh, PTSD patients, most of them uh, can't handle anyone touching them. So if you mm -hmm. have like, uh, you, you might be raped, you don't want anyone to, to come to touch you firstly. So, so you need to have the sense of uh, safety and boundaries and the, that you have the ability to uh, say no and uh, and and so they, 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 it, we are not going to do any manual techniques at first okay. but we can we can include that include that also and it's of course important to get there, that it's okay that somebody touches you, it's okay, safe that somebody touches you, and you can set the boundaries in there. So of course we are going going there. That is safe to be close. And working with uh, patients that have schizophrenia, they might come really close. They don't might don't they mm -hmm. might not have this uh, sense of uh, personal space. Uh, I have worked with uh, schizophrenic patients and patients with uh, psychosis. They might come really co close because they don't think that it's, uh, they don't see that <laughs> that you you need your space. Uh, uh, so that might uh, influence uh, in their ability to interaction with other people. They might, might somebody might even punch them because they come too close and they don't understand that they are mm. they are going to some others uh, area but so of course some of them can't manage that someone is touching so you need to 
takes little steps and and of course patients with schizophrenia are there are like 100 different types of <laughs> feeling that and and the reasons for having a schizophrenia and uh, the, how it affects you so some might like actually having manual therapy and some don't and that's fine we don't have to do the same things with everyone Thank you, Vanya. Very, very interesting perspective. So it's about perception and how can one perceive touch, boundaries, the lack of perception of touch and boundaries. So a very interesting way of um, uh, looking at verbals and non-verbals here. Yet again, I latch on to what you said before. And um, now I would like to give the floor to um, a colleague from, of mine from Malta, Diane. She works in mental health as well one of the newbies who is very passionate on, on the mental health sector in Malta. And Daniel, the, our, Diane in the chat box touched up on group therapy. Diane, perhaps you want to intervene and kickstart, you know, another part of our approach within mental health care. Thank you, Diane. The floor is yours. Hi, Maria. Thank you all for this opportunity to connect, finally. <laughs> um, yeah, so basically, um, we have been... Uh, focusing on giving this, this service to, in, the, in the community, within the community. Um, uh, and we have focused on physical activity mainly through programs. Um, uh, we use various methods, um, including the ones I have put down in the chat, but not just those. We do both one-to-one -one sessions and um, uh, group therapy. We find group therapy to be very effective, especially when it comes um, uh, to self-esteem and gaining confidence and self-efficacy. Um, but not just that, um, as you were saying, uh, certain uh, service users, they have this issue with, with boundaries and uh, exercise. We find that it helps with, with um, their boundaries as well and with interacting with other people especially when there is social isolation due to psychosis, for example, or even neurosis, but mo mostly we see it in psychosis. Um, uh, they literally have to learn again um, from scratch how to interact with others. Um, uh, yes, something very interesting that really works within our communities is uh, nature therapy. So we have been combining outdoor training with um, mindfulness as well. And we found it to be very effective and we promote mindfulness and uh, I've been doing some courses about it as well. And uh, it's helping a lot with pain management, especially especially body scans. So that's an area that we should <laughs> be um, going into as well, possibly. Um, uh, Yes, um, uh, we've been focusing a lot on circuit training as well. Obviously not like the mainstream classes. You, you focus on, it's rather customized as well. So you might be within the same group, but one is doing five, for example, sit to stands, another person is doing 10 sit to stands. So it doesn't have to be like um, that, that uh, rigid um, style that we see in normal fitness classes. Um, uh, yes, uh, what else? I think, think about something that I might- Thank you, Diane. Say. That's it. Um, Tanya and Christina, do you have any position about group sessions and even this approach to being closer to nature with a more sustainable approach and less impactful, less environmental, more environmentally friendly approach to physiotherapy as well. Um, yeah. I don't know who wants to start. Tanya? I can, I can start. Tanya. Well, uh, in Finland, uh, we have a lot of forests <laughs> and we have all, all, uh, uh, always lived near nature. So it's uh, quite a big part of our also. So we can, we can take groups and go to the nature and and uh, we also use mindfulness quite a lot in uh, uh, yeah, in mental health care. Uh, but I'm all, almost allergic to that because they're trying to give, give uh, mindfulness to everybody and do everything and it uh, heals everything. Uh, I have like, oof, 
it's it's a nice a nice concept, uh, but not to everyone <laughs> and not to every everything. And um, yeah, we have also uh, it. It sounds really familiar what you're doing there. Yes. Okay. Thank you, Tanya. Christina, would you like to um, comment about group therapy? And then we'll go for our final intervention from Loredana from Italy, because it seems like there was a chat going on with regards to her comments, so we can conclude with that. So, Christina, yes. something on group sessions and <laughs> perhaps nature therapy as well, if you okay. have um, to do it in your country. Yes, uh, in, in physiotherapy mental health, uh, we uh, use the therapeutic factors of group uh, described by Yalom. And we can use uh, conscientiously in this way. And you, you, the, the group is uh, therapeutic in, by itself. And that uh, skills uh, are important uh, skills, uh, tools in, in our professional uh, role. And in nature, is uh, they, they have a lot of effective in all the groups in nature, and there are some evidence about that. Yes, all that. Thank you, Christina. Um, I pass the word to Loredana, colleague from Italy. Um, Loredana, the floor is yours. Feel free to comment, discuss with whatever. Um, you have been discussing in the chat so that we, we give it a bit of value and as well our speakers can contribute to your comment. Thank you. Uh, good evening. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay. Porta chiaro, Lore. <laughs> Grazie. <laughs> good evening to everyone. Thank you for the presentation. They were very, very, very interesting. Um, I wrote on it in a chat because uh, uh, my Europe uh, region colleagues uh, knows very well that in Italy we have a, a, a particular situation because uh, uh, we have uh, a specific profession for mental health issues uh, that is called psychiatric uh, rehabilitator. It's not a physiotherapist. Um, so it is a a specific field uh, of work in the rehabilitation. And so I have no direct uh, experience in this, uh, in this field, obviously, uh, but I know uh, many of the psychiatric rehabilitators uh, and uh, I was very impressed by their work because uh, their main uh, intervention is, uh, is a multidisciplinary team. First of all, this is the first, uh, the first thing very important. Uh, and I, I found very interesting their work in the um, eating disorder, for example. Uh, in this field in particular, they have a, 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 strong, a strong role. Um, and they use, they use the um, extended cognitive behavioral uh, intervention, it is called uh, just like this. Um, but um, uh, by by all the, the things I I hear today, uh, the interface, the kind of the types of information that are uh, mostly uh, that you describe well, uh, so like boundaries, for example, uh, rebuilding uh, the uh, the patient idea of his or her body, for example, in eating disorders. And um, we are different, I think. Uh, I don't think that there is another specific profession like ours in Italy, in other countries, because I um, spoke about this with my colleagues. Uh, and uh, I know that is a, a, a particular issue. The, the other things I, want, I wanted to say that for sure, they don't work with dementia, for example. With dementia, there's no intervention from this, uh, this, uh, this question, this colleagues. That's all I wanted to say, my contribute. Thank you. 
Um, thank you, Loredana. Um, in fact, Loredana and I in the past have discussed this. You know, it's 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 a situation where is it a specialized role or is it it falls within our scope of practice? But interesting to say is that if a patient suffering from schizophrenia needs to do a total knee replacement, physiotherapists and rehabilitation hospitals in Italy would need to manage all the situation of the patients, and we know that mental health issues have become a comorbidity within all our patients contexts, age groups and whatever we end up to see so i think we should still go there despite oh, yeah, of there is a, of a, a legal framework exactly yeah. it, it's but, not it's not to say it's not to say in fact we we indeed uh, also we physiotherapists have a role uh, because we we could meet we can meet in our daily work some some fashion with it, mental issues uh, no so uh, we have to intervene of course but for specific pathology uh, just like for example i repeat uh, eating eating disorders that we have a specific uh -huh. profession, a specific okay profession. so with your kind permission i would like to ask you to extend for a couple of minutes because there is a colleague of ours jurita who has been trying to um uh, include some valid comments and I wasn't sure if she was still on the chat but now we managed to communicate so Jurit I give you the floor she said well, she won't take long and I'm sure of that thank and you perhaps <laughs> Christine and Tanya you can reply directly to her and start concluding this session thank yeah, you Jurit uh, I'm sorry I, I totally no, it's, okay, it's, okay. You it's totally fine and and I promise I won't take much time I just wanted a few suggestions on like as a physio uh because um at a point when we, if we realize that the pain is actually because of psychological aspect, then how do we, how do we actually communicate and explain to the patient that the problem is the psychological aspect? So uh, how do we explain, you know, explain it to the patient and communicate it? You're getting my question. So, so how do we do that? Any tips? Thank you. Um, I would like to give the floor to Christine and perhaps Christina, whilst you let it, you can conclude. Then Tanya, you can follow through and as well give your concluding remarks about today's um, session, today's webinar. Thank you. Christina? Yes, yes. Um, in, in chronic pain, the, the, I think it's not psychological aspect uh, and the patients have to be clear that it's a neurophysiological aspect. So it's the, the way or the pathways of neurophysiological or neurobiological uh, aspects or the, mm, about their brain, no? the interpretation of the reality and the inputs in their brain and the beliefs, uh, perceptions are important. And in the, the physiotherapy, uh, the physiotherapist has to um, do a uh, educational role, important educational role in this in these conditions. I think. Thank you. And also, if you have, if you're really stressed or have anxiety, it's not something that you imagine that you have pain. You actually have pain because your body is really tensed, and that is causing that pain. It's real pain. Your muscles are feeling <laughs> really painful. So you need to work with that also. But you need to work with that stress or anxiety also, because if you just stretch or massage or do some exercises, it doesn't go away. If you heal, still have that stress, uh, stress or anxiety. So you need to also work with those too. So you don't, uh, you can't separate the body and the mind. You need to work with uh, both together. Yeah, so like we as physios, we can, or we as health professionals, we understand that fact, right? We cannot separate. Mm -hmm. We need that yes. holistic, psycho, yeah, like uh, physical and psychosocial aspects. We need, but when we are trying to explain it to the patients, I mean, how much they will be able to understand that is like, uh, I mean, that's what I was saying. How to make them understand that uh, that a psych this psychological aspect is also really important, and it also influences the pain, the extent of pain, the severity of pain. Well, I think that we all have our uh, ways to explain that, but uh, I have tried to learn to explain this pain and anxiety and stuff like that 
uh, as I would explain it to my grandma. So you need to explain it like really basic uh, level. Patient doesn't care what happens in their brain cells or something like that. They actually need to know how my body reacts and, and how can I influence that. So try to keep the words in real, real life words and how you actually can uh, uh, manage those things. So, so we all know that if we feel stressed or anxiety, our body gets tense, our muscles in, in our neck and shoulders get really stiff and we get headaches and it's really hard to uh, sleep or stuff like that. Everybody understands that. Our patients understand understands that. So try to find your words to explain those things. So try to learn uh, this, uh, how it this uh, different symptoms affect to our, our body and how our body affects to our mind and then find your own words to explain these to your patients and try to find these basic ground level words using that so that you can they actually understand it thank they you. don't care about their cells uh, brain cells and stuff like that <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Tanya. Thank you. Very well explained. You know, some practical tips that we all will take home with us. Um, time to conclude. Um, uh, I will leave it up to the chair, um, Esther Mary, to Mary Darcy, to conclude um, the session, the chair of the Europe Region of World Physiotherapy. Before, I would like Katri to say a quick goodbye, but if you allow me two minutes, um, I've written some tips that came out throughout the session, which our take home message would be to have data sets on mental health practices, communication tools with practical elements for physios patient one-to-one -one daily um, contact, um, standards of practice, and definitely what has really transpired today were the innovative techniques that are being used at EU level. Katri, I leave it up to you, and then Esther Mary, you can conclude. Thank you very much, thank you. So thank you very much for all for joining our webinar. It has been very interesting and very active. So it, it has been a pleasure to be with this webinar. And I have done notes for our working group that we can take tips from you also to carry on with this matter. So thank you and good night. And now Esther Mary. Uh, thank you, Katri. And this is uh, firstly, uh, apologies for, for not being here at the beginning. I'm really sorry. Um, secondly, I'd like to thank the joint chairs, um, Katri and uh, Maria, um, and also Tanya and Christina for the talks. I'm immensely proud of the mental health working group that we have. And I know that they're incredibly hard workers and that they, they meet very often and, and prepare very carefully for everything that they that they that they do. So I, I think really a big thank you to them. Um, I think that tonight's numbers here have shown um that you know there's a huge interest among physiotherapists in mental health. It is part of our scope of practice. I don't think we even have to discuss uh, that. Um, we know from Moridan about the situation in Italy, but really we are the experts in, in physical activity and in human movement. And we have a huge role to play in people suffering with mental health issues. The, the evidence between um, physical activity and mental health is just irrefutable and we, as physiotherapists are strongly positioned uh, to help people with their mental health conditions. Um, so thank you again. Um, it's it's been wonderful. I thought the debate was super. You know, sometimes we have webinars with very few questions, but really there was really good questions and good discussion this evening. So thank you very much to all of you for participating. And I think you'll be hearing from the working group in terms of the tips that they're collating. Mm -hmm. um, and perhaps we'll have a we'll have a kind of tips for physiotherapists. Uh, in mental health um, as well to, to add to uh, our repertoire of documents. So thank you very much again and good night.